So I think there's sort of two levels of issue. The first level is the immediacy of the data that government would like collected on and kept on all of us. They say only to be accessed um, under the uh, warrantless schemes for the metadata and the warranted schemes, the warrant schemes for, um, we're not always sure it's warranted, but uh, for, um, uh, for the actual content. And uh, you'd say, okay, well, with the, the warrantless access of the metadata, which is done by a surprising number of agencies, so um, it's not just, you know, the intelligence agencies dealing with the terrorist threat. Uh, it's also uh, the RSPCA and the um, agencies triple C uh, and apparently Australia Post, um, a wide range of agencies one needs to ask, do you really need all of my personal data? Um, but th so, so that's sort of the first, the first level worry. Uh, and included in that is the idea that metadata is extremely personal information. So, you know, I like how this debate has been framed by the agencies that are seeking to expand their power uh, as it's just metadata. Right? It's just metadata, it's just fluff, it's junk DNA, it doesn't really matter. Well, anyone who has been involved in you know, reasonable probing investigation uh, would very likely say metadata will tell you a great deal about someone. And if you have enough data, metadata for a long enough period of time, you can get uh, as clear, sometimes more clear, a picture of them than you can from the content of the conversations. So that, that's the first point. The second point that I don't think has been discussed very much, in fact, I've seen almost nothing of it in the public debate, is what happens to this data in the long run? Okay. So it isn't just about, oh, okay, it's stored two years, great. The agencies that have been able to access it in those two years without a warrant, how long do they store it for? Under what terms are they able to give it to somebody else? Under what terms are they able to use it? And if all this information is being gathered, so you've not, you're not just talking about storing metadata for longer than you would otherwise have stored it, you may also be changing information that would otherwise not be stored at all or only for a few seconds or minutes or hours by an ISP into something that is effectively retained that wouldn't have been in a, in a practical sense. And you say, well, what is that, what can that be used for? Well, with predictive analytics in, you know, being a field of research related to computer science these days, you can do forward prediction based on all this data that you've gathered on someone. Really, are they likely to become criminals in the future? Can we, can we now say that we should be watching them for the next 10 years closely, monitoring the content of their conversations because we think they might engage in a terrorist act? You know, th what this does is open the door to basically a change in the premise of our whole society from innocent until proven guilty to you might be guilty in the future and therefore we are entitled to invade your privacy. So those are the two things that I'm sort of most alert to about the potential changes. Um, so I, I'd like to echo what you said about metadata. I hope tonight we can put that term to rest because what they actually want is more data about the things that you do. The, uh, the, the term metadata is, you know, it's confusing both to the legislators, obviously, when you look at how they talk about it, <laughs> and, and, and to the public, and it, it's, it's really a distraction. So, of course, I'd, I'd echo everything Sulet says. I, you know, the current government, um, and all governments, in fact, like to talk about a cost-benefit analysis when they're sceptical of, you know, some proposal, usually by the other guys. And I think that might be a, a useful frame to look at this current proposal as well, because... Um, you know, what are the costs? Now, obviously, it costs money and there's a technical implementation and whatnot, but it's a cost to our privacy. Does our privacy have value? Yes, it does, and I think we'll probably talk about that a little more tonight. Um, it, you know, it has value in that it protects us against you know, future developments by the government that might not be so benign, and it has an inherent value um, in and of itself, I'm sure we'd all agree. But what are the benefits? And the law enforcement agencies have not done a great job in making a very compelling case where evidence exists about the effectiveness of this extra data and how it uh, uh, enables them to solve crimes and which kinds of crimes are solved and prevented and whatnot. It's actually not that, it's actually not very compelling. Um, the, the word terrorism gets bandied about a lot. It's, um, you know, probably everybody here knows that's a, one of the oldest tricks in the political book, but, um, uh, does it really have anything to do with this, with this discussion, with this proposal? Um, it's, it's a very tenuous link. So, so one, one part of my bio that, that, that wasn't mentioned is I've, um, up until a couple of months ago, I worked in the federal parliament for three years, um, you know, 
uh, an excellent experience to learn about how some of the um, laws are made, the sausage factory analogy and all of that. And so finally, the one thing I would like to maybe um, touch on later on the night is, uh, you know, what, what's the genesis of this and how can they be persuaded to change their minds? Because, you know, their pressure is coming from one, one particular sector and that's this, like, police and security and intelligence services. How can we create counter pressure uh, that might, might negate that? And that's an important question. <coughs> Thanks. Uh, well, I've got sort of three perspectives spanning over the last sort of 20 years of research. And one is the uh, macro observation leading on from what Colin was saying about it's just an interesting turn of events. There internationally in the US, Australia, Canada, uh, parts of Europe, was a great fervour in the 90s and the early 2000s for electronic democracy. The idea that we increase transparency and we provide joined up services. And of course, the, a major turning point when that spirit was damped was 9-11. And the motivation to introduce extra special powers around the threat of terrorism seemed to have shifted that discourse significantly. The discourse around electronic democracies continued in certain forms, but I noticed quite a visible and steep decline. At, at, a, at, a, at a meso level, at a, mid, uh, a middle level, I was involved in working with highly at risk young people in uh, parts of Western Australia, where the big trouble was being able to, for the various services around these young people, being able to identify ways of uh, looking after them, providing secure environments, getting them the help they need. And the major challenge, one of the, there were a number of barriers, but one of the major barriers was the sharing of data. It was virtually impossible despite the efforts of joined up approaches of police, judiciary, uh, NGOs, all the various parties around these young people, the major barriers was, uh, and, and the barrier and, and in, in political terms was coming from, well, it's just not possible to share this kind of data, how things have changed. The final one is relates to individuals themselves and young people, and I presume we'll come back to this again because you've you prompted a few things, Colin, is that what their relationship to privacy is. And the work that, the work that we're doing currently with young people and their uses of technology produce very, very complex, a very complex picture of their relationship to privacy. And I can't generalise because it's quite differentiated. But amongst some of the uh, major currents are things like the way that they understand and treat privacy is not like it was previously. Public and private domains have become infused in the same manner as if you want to put a young person to sleep, put the word cyber in front of what you're talking about. They don't differentiate between those spaces. Similarly, public and, and private are becoming morphed. Now, if we want to talk about it more, I can talk about their specific attitudes and how they then navigate that in technological terms and their relationship to the kinds of changes. But one thing I would flag if we don't go down that pathway is Young people uh, exhibit great common sense in their use of technology, but I'm not entirely sure that their use of the, they're aware of the abuse of its power, even when we see things like the hacking of the cloud that's just happened in the last two weeks. <laughs>